Hello and welcome to another shader sandwich tutorial. My name is Sean and today I'll be showing you how to create this really nice looking water shader. So I'll just give you a few seconds to take a look at it. Here it is. So basically it's got animated waves obviously, reflection of the environment around it, and also refraction of the objects beneath it. It's got a few different control properties such as the density which lets you control how murky it is and also how much it fades into the edge. You can also change the color of it. So that's pretty cool. Alright, so before we get started, I'm going to quickly talk about something. Basically, a shader never makes up for good art. And the thing is, when it comes to water, it's highly refractive and reflective, and so it needs an environment around it to actually work correctly. Without the environment, it just looks boring. For example, if I take away the terrain, and I take away the skybox, it just looks really flat. So, for the purpose of this tutorial, I'm going to spend the first five minutes or so showing you how to recreate that lake scene I had at the start. For those of you who already have an environment set up for this, or just simply can't be bothered, that's fair. Feel free to click this button over here to skip ahead to the next part. But yeah, so for now, let's actually create that environment. So, I'm going to go ahead and create a new scene. So, for this environment, I had to import a few assets. One of these I got from the Asset Store. It's completely free, it's called SkyFX1. So simply download that and import it in. I've already imported it. When you're done with that, import the environment package that comes with Unity 5. This one here. This contains what we need to create all the trees and grass. It'll pop up like this, just import all of it. Alright, so now let's actually create our scene. I'm going to be kind of quick here because I don't want to spend too much time away from actually creating the shader. So, let's just get this started. So, first I'm going to do is create the terrain, like so. And I'm going to go ahead and give it a grass texture. Just by going in here, and I'm just going to add in the default, the grass rocky one. There we go. Next I'm going to add some trees. I'm just going to add in the palm tree desktop. There we go. I'm going to go ahead and scatter these around. I'll just mass place them. Alright, there we go. That should be enough trees to keep us covered. Alright, now I'm going to go ahead and add some grass. So I'm just going to add a grass texture. And I'm just going to go ahead and use this one here. Finally, I'm going to take off the healthy color to white. Because it just looks cartoony otherwise. Alright, so now I'll spread some of this around. Now, one thing is, my computer is not particularly great, so I'm going to want to go ahead and lower the density of this grass a lot. So I'm going to go into the settings and lower the density to something like 0.1 or so. Let me just head back to where the grass was. See how performance is. Not too bad now. Something like that works alright. Alright, finally, I'm going to create the hole. So I'm just going to go ahead and go into our raised lower terrain. Now, one problem is, if we actually try to lower it currently, it won't work. This is because the terrain is already as low as it can go. So if we head over into the second tab, Flatten, we can actually raise the height of the terrain. I'm going to go ahead and zoom out and raise the height to 120 by clicking Flatten. And there we go. So now if I zoom back in and find the grass, I should be able to create the hole. I'm going to lower the opacity a lot, and now I'm just going to hold down Shift and paint a little bit. I'm going to make mine a little smaller for the purpose of this tutorial. Alright, something like that seems to work alright. Now I'll just go ahead and delete the trees and grass that are within it. Feel free to add some in the immediate areas around the water though, as this really helps add to the refraction part. Okay, finally, I'm going to go ahead and add the water plane. So game object, 3D object, plane. Then I just have to move it into position. And I may have to scale it up a little bit. Alright, so now I'm going to go ahead and set the skybox by going into the lighting panel, which can be found in Window, Lighting. And I'm going to go ahead and set it to the Sky FX 3, which is just a very nice sunny day. Finally, I'm going to add a reflection probe, which will be what the water ends up reflecting. Add a game object, light, reflection probe. Set this to the middle of the plane. Uh, eventually. 
Here we are. And then just set it to be vaguely the same size as the plane. Something like this will work well for mine. Doesn't have to be perfect, especially since it's not going to work 100% anyway due to it not being circular. But the idea will be there. Finally, you'll definitely want to increase the Y axis a lot. So, let's create the water shader. Open up Shader Sandwich. And I'm going to go ahead and create a new shader. And I'll open up the previewing window. Now, the thing is, we want to be able to edit our shader, but we want to see what it looks like inside the environment we've created. To do this is really easy. Shader Sandwich creates a material automatically called SS Temp. So if you do a search for that in the project window, you'll find it really easily. Simply set the water plane's material to SS Temp. Now, as we edit in Shader Sandwich, it will automatically show up here as well. Pretty nifty. So to start, we're going to create the reflections. So we're going to use the built-in reflections of the PBR lighting type. First, create a layer in the specular channel, and set it all the way up to white. Now if we go ahead and go into our passes, we can increase the specular size to make it nice and shiny, like so. Alright, so obviously this doesn't look very good, and I realized in my reflection probe I actually forgot to turn on box projection, so just turn that on now. Alright, so this doesn't look any good at all. However, now we're going to add all our ripples and animations to the water, which will make it look a lot nicer. Alright, well let's grab up Shader Sandwich and head on into our layers. So we're going to be changing the normals of the water to create our fake bumps, our ripples. So add a new layer. To start off, we're going to use a procedurally generated noise type. So set the noise to procedural, pearl and noise. And set the dimension to 3D. What this will allow us to do is if we alter this on the Z direction, it will actually animate and ripple for us, instead of just moving across the surface. So let's go ahead, I'm just going to move this out of the way a bit. We're going to mess around in the effects panel. So first we'll definitely want to go ahead and make it a lot smaller. So add the mapping scale effect. Turn off separate, and let's bump this up to something more like... I don't know, somewhere around there looks good, 25. I'm going to go with 30. Now, you'll notice it doesn't look very good. This is because it's not a normal map, but we can convert it to one really easily. Just add the conversion normal map effect. And there we go, that looks a lot better. Alright, so now we're going to get it to animate. Go ahead and add the mapping offset effect. We're going to animate the Z offset to animate the pearl and noise. So add an input for the Z offset, and head on into the inputs panel. So if we turn off visible, then we can set the replacement to time, basic, slow. In this case, I think slow looks the best. In fact, we may even want to go for very slow. We're creating a very sort of calm look here. However, obviously, if you want a faster looking motion, then just increase that. Alright, now to make it look a bit more detailed. Already this looks kinda nice, but it's lacking a lot of the little details that water has. So let's go ahead and add those now. So let's add a new layer, and in this case we're going to use a texture. So select Resources Texture as the layer type, and as usual, add an input. Now, we're going to go ahead and select the small waves texture that comes with Shader Sandwich. And here it is. So just like last time, we're definitely going to want to scale this down. So add the mapping scale effect again. And we're going to want to set this to something like 60. These are going to be our smaller waves that move across the surface. These add a lot of detail, and they're very computationally simple. However, they don't look very good by themselves, hence why we add the polar noise beforehand. So yeah, I think a scale of 30 looks pretty good, maybe even a little lower, 20? Kind of overestimated with 60. <laughs> Alright, something like that looks pretty good. However, we may also want to lower the mix amount. I'm going to set my mix amount to somewhere around there, and I may also lower the polar noise as well. Now, another thing is currently we're mixing these together as if they're just standard textures. If we want, we can use the normals mix mode to actually add the two on top of each other in the correct manner. So now we can have both of them at the same time. So I'm going to set mine to something like that. Finally, we get to animate this texture. So let's add another mapping offset effect. And in this case, let's just animate the X offset. I'm just going to set it to the same input as the pearl and noise, the Z offset. And there we go, now it moves across. Now, if it's getting a little laggy for you, this is because it's also animating this in the real-time layer preview. Feel free to turn off animate layer previews. It will make things run a lot faster. 
Obviously, currently, it doesn't look that good, because we've got this very obvious texture moving in that direction. One thing we can do is increase the scale, which will help make it look a bit more random. But another thing we can do, is we can have another copy of this texture moving in the opposite direction, to create more random motion. To do this, copy-paste the layer, then go ahead into the offset effect, and remove the input from the X offset. Next, go into the Y offset, and set it to the same input. Now I'll be moving across in the opposite direction, creating a lot more random motion, as you can see here. Finally, you might want to lower the amount these two get mixed, so that way they don't become too noisy. Alright, and there we go, we have the basis for our reflections. Time to work on the refraction. Thanks, AVG. So, in order to work on our refraction, let's turn off the specular for a bit. I'm going to set the specular down to black. So obviously this doesn't look very good currently. So what we're going to do is we're going to get it to show what's underneath it, and then we're going to distort that texture. So add a new layer in the albedo. What we need to do is access the pixels that are underneath. To do this, we can use what's called the grab pass. If we go ahead and set our layer type to screen grab, you'll see what I mean. If we move over to our shader preview, we can have a look at what this is doing. As you can see, it has an actual texture of what the screen looked like before the object was drawn. If we then set the mapping type to view, so that it's plastered on top, it effectively becomes invisible, other than for lighting and reflection. If we have a look on our water shader, you can see the same thing. Now, before we start adding distortion, you'll notice it's a lot brighter, or it may be darker on your screen. This is due to the fact it's being affected by lighting. Now, we don't really want it to be affected by lighting, because it's just meant to be what's underneath. So let's disable lighting. What we're going to do is scroll across here. This set of layer channels affect the lighting. They allow you to customize lighting effects. In this case, what we're going to do is just change the diffuse lighting, which is the light that comes directly from the light and isn't specular, and we're just going to set it to straight white. Now, it's still very bright, and this is due to ambient lighting. Finally, if we head on into our passes and scroll down to the bottom, just disable ambient lighting. And as you can see, now it looks invisible. Hooray! So now we can go ahead and add our distortion mapping. So if we go back over to our albedo, we can have a look in here. What we need to do is add the mapping displace effect. The mapping displace effect uses a mask to displace the texture. So what we're going to do is create a mask now, which we'll use to distort it. So go into the mask tab, and call the mask distortion. Now, the displace effect uses what are called RGBA masks. Masks are generally grayscale. However, in Shader Sandwich, you can also treat them as complete color masks, and these can be used in a wide variety of effects. So down the bottom, change it from red to just red, green, blue, alpha. Now we have all the color channels to play around with. Now, for the distortion, what we can do is just copy-paste what we did for the reflection into the mask. So let's go ahead and do that. Right-click copy, and right-click paste. And just do the same for the other. Copy, paste. You may even want to add the final one. Copy, paste. Alright, so now if we go into our albedo, and set the displace mask to be that new mask, now just increase the displace amount to see the effect. And there we go. So go ahead and increase the displace amount to whatever you want. I'm going to go with something like... Negative 0.15, I think looks pretty good. Although obviously you can just make that positive. Either way works. Alright, now you may have noticed an issue here, which is that the water isn't refracting the grass. If we raise the water plane, you can see how it actually cuts off the grass. Now there's a good reason for this. If we have a look in the albedo, it's using the grab pass. But the question of the grab pass is when it actually takes the screenshot of the screen, before rendering the object. <laughs> In Unity, objects are rendered in an order, so if we take the grab pass before the grass is rendered, then it won't include the grass. Now, we can actually change when the water is rendered. Head over into the passes, and have a look over at the side here, next to the shader name. You'll see an area called Q. In Unity, there are a bunch of different render queues, which define when an object gets rendered. If we set it to be manual by turning auto off, we can actually change this queue. If we set it to something like transparent, then you can see now it's included the grass. You'll also notice another issue has arisen, which is the water is extremely dark, and this is due to it casting a shadow. Simply select for water plane and turn cast shadows off. Alright, so now we can go ahead and begin blending our refractive layer with our reflective layer. 
So let's go do that now. So head back into layers. So what we want is our water to become less reflective the closer to the edge it gets. So that way the middle is reflective, and then it slowly fades out as it reaches the edge. So what we're going to do is create a mask which contains the depth of the water. In order to do this, we're going to calculate it using the depth pass. The idea is that we'll get the distance from the screen that the objects underneath the water have, and we'll subtract the distance from the screen that the water plane itself has. If this doesn't make sense to you, don't worry, we're going to be doing it very visually, so you'll see what's happening. Alright, well let's get started. So in order to visualize our mask, let's just create two layers in the albedo. Create one that starts off black, and then create another that is white. Next, over in our masks, create a new mask and call this Depth. Finally, go back into Pass and set the white layer to use that mask. So now as we manipulate our mask, we'll be able to see visually what's actually happening. So, what we're going to do is we're going to start off by visualizing the depth. So, add a new layer and set it to the Screen Depth Pass. And just like with the Grab Pass, we want to use the View Mapping Type mode. Now, this probably just looks really boring, it's this white. In order to visualize this better, add a new Maths Divide effect, and then increase the divide amount. You'll see as you increase it that it actually begins to show the depth of the objects, the distance from the camera that they are. See? Alright, so now we need to get the distance from the camera to the water, rather than the objects underneath the water. Add a new layer, and set this to the basic literal type. The distance from the object being rendered to the camera is set within the view, so set it to the view layer mode. So within the view mapping type, in the Z channel, the distance is stored. So if we use the color swizzle effect, we can set all our channels to the blue channel, or the distance. So now you can see that it's using the distance. Once again it's gone all white, but as you get close it becomes dimmer. If we added the divide effect, we'd get basically the same thing, except it would be the water plane rather than the objects underneath it. So finally, if we go back to our depth layer and we remove the divide effect, and then we go into our depth 2 layer and set this to be subtract, we get the difference between the two. And this is our depth. So now you can see the areas towards the shore are darker than the areas in the middle. And this is because the areas in the middle are deeper. Alright, so now let's add another layer and set this to be the basic previous type. We want to be able to change how quickly it transitions down there, so add the maths multiply effect. So now if you decrease this, you can see how we can alter the depth. Now finally, add the maths clamp effect. What this does is the numbers in the white part actually go above 1, so the clamp effect ensures that the black parts are 0 and the white parts are 1, and the numbers don't go outside those ranges. Alright, well now let's actually use this pass. So head back into our main layers and delete the visualization layers in the albedo. Now if we head over into specular and we add a new layer and set this to be whatever specular color we want, such as the sort of dim white, then we can use this mask to make it reflective in the middle and not so reflective on the outside. See? So now as we decrease or increase this multiply value, we can make it either more reflective or less reflective, the closer it gets towards the center. Alright, cool. Well, we're almost done, but just a few other issues to fix. First off, let's have a look on the side here. In case you haven't noticed, when we actually move this across, this part is getting kind of glitchy. This is due to the displace effect. If we go back into our albedo layer, we can alter the displace middle. So as you can see when we drag this, it offsets where it displaces from. So we just want to set this to where the edge of the screen isn't glitching out. And that looks pretty good. Alright. Our second issue, if we find an area without grass, can be seen pretty easily. You can see how it cuts off as soon as it reaches the edge, due to it just intersecting with the polygon. Well, we can use a similar technique to what we did to blend the reflective layer with the reflective layer, to blend this with the edge. What we want to do is go into our masks, and add a new mask, and call this Depth 2. Next, copy-paste these layers across. Finally, add another effect to the previous layer, add a Maths Multiply, and just simply increase this a bit. I'm going to set mine to 5. I eyeballed this earlier and it seems to work well. So now what we can do if we go back in the Pass 1, if we copy and paste our Grab Pass, 
and then from the one above remove the displace effect. If we go back to the other one, we can set this to use our new depth 2 mask. So now we've done effectively the same thing that we did for our reflective layer. We simply increase the amount that it exists, the deeper the water gets. So if we head back into our mask, depth 2, if you change this multiply value, you can change the strength. If you increase it too high, you'll notice it just cuts off again. So just decrease it to something kind of small. In my case, I find actually 50 works pretty well, which kind of surprises me. But hey, eh, you know, shaders, they're not exactly technical. Yeah, 35 actually. Alright, and there we go. Well, we're almost done. We have our shader, and it's looking pretty good. We can alter the density, we can alter the colors, we can alter the amount of refractiveness. It's pretty cool. Now, I'm going to do something a bit different this tutorial. I'm going to cover actually making the shader usable by an end artist. Because the thing is, currently, if we have a look at our material panel, it's not exactly the prettiest looking shader, and you can't really alter the values that well. So let's make the shader look nice, both visually and also when actually editing it. Let's head over into our inputs panel and take a look. Currently, all we have is the wave texture. Well, let's go ahead and name it that at least, wave texture. Now, an artist using this shader might want to have more control. So let's have a look at what we can set. First off, the density. We'll definitely want to add control for that. So go over into our depth mask and the bottom here and add an input for the multiply effect. You'll want to add an input for the other multiply effect as well over in the second one. Not the larger one, but the small one, the first one. Set this to the same. Now, we'll want to go ahead and name this, so head on into Inputs and set this to Water water Density, or maybe Thickness. Now, they might also want control over the size of the ripples, so let's go ahead and give them that as well. Head back into Layers, into Pass 1, and into our Normals. First off, we'll change the scale of the pearl and noise, so add an input for that. Then we'll want to add an input for our wave texture. So go ahead and add an input for both of the scales for those as well. I'm going to link the two ripple textures together. Now if we head on into our inputs, we can name these nicely, like Perlin Noise Scale and Water Texture Scale. And there we go. So now if we have a look, it's looking a lot nicer as a shader. And in fact, if we save this out and apply it to another material, we can really get a good look at how it can be edited in the Material Inspector. I'm just going to call mine Water Tutorial. Save. And then I'll just quickly go out here. Assets. Create Material. Water Tutorial. And set this to use our Water Tutorial shader. Finally, drag that in here, and we can really take a look at it. And as you can see, it's got a really nice set of attributes that we can change. Water texture can be controlled easily. And all in all, it's looking pretty nice. Alright, cool. Well, we're done. Hopefully this tutorial made sense. It's one of the more complicated ones, but I think the end result looks pretty good. Alright, well, thanks for watching. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave a comment below, and I'll try and answer it promptly. If you have any suggestions for other tutorials as well, feel free to leave a comment. Alright, thanks for watching. See you guys later.